Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello again, Fading Memories listeners. You know, I always appreciate you giving a little bit of your time. Today, we're talking about Lewy body dementia, which is not something I've talked a lot about. And I've learned some stuff about Lewy body from today's guest, Mary Lou Falcone. She wrote the book, I Didn't See It Coming. Have any of us seen it coming? So thanks for joining us, Mary Ann. I'm happy to be here, Jennifer. Thank you for inviting me. So you didn't see Louie Body coming. Um, Louie Body affected your sweet hubby, Nikki Zahn. So you want to tell us a little bit about Nikki uh, pre-Louie Body? Absolutely. Uh, Nikki was a force of nature. He was a rocker in the 1950s. And you know, everybody says, oh, yeah, the, the basement band, right? And I say, no, not the basement band. He was on the road at age 14 with the likes of Jerry Lee Lewis, Patsy Klein, and Johnny Cash. So he was a for real rocker. And at 21, decided that uh, his rock and roll days were over. That was enough. And he would then devote his time to what his passion was always, which was art painting, drawing, uh, illustration, etc. And he became a premier illustrator. His work hangs uh, today in the Victorian Albert Museum. And uh, he was said to have been the inspiration for Roy Lichtenstein. So Nikki's pop art came before Lichtenstein's pop art came, which is very nice to know. And, um, and, and Nikki was... Um, I think to categorize him as a kind man is an understatement. He was he was absolutely the life of every party. He was the kind of person who made you feel at home, even if you were suffering from from a, a, an anxiety in, in the situation you were in. Um, when he died, which was in July of 2020, uh, over 250 notes came in, all saying basically the same thing. He always made us feel special. He was the kindest person we knew. And that is a thumbnail sketch of Nikki. <laughs> so in your book, his art is the art, the beginning of each chapter. Hold up yes. a little bit if yes. I can get it straight for those who That's are correct. watching the video. Um, so you guys were humming along, handling life, and then some situations occurred. Right. We, we had been uh, friends since 1973. In 1983, we got together as a couple. Nikki was married when I first met him. His ex-wife and I are still good friends, which is, says a lot for, for him and, and for her. And um, he uh, in, in 83, we became a couple. We were a couple for 34 years. And at that juncture, um, I asked Nikki to marry me. Why did I do that? Because I had said no to his invitations for 34 years to marry him. And the reason I, I said no is because we had a great life together. We had everything going for us. And my theory was, if it's not broken, why would you fix it? It was perfect. But I began to see things that didn't feel right. And I thought, you know, if you love that hard, then you need to be able to protect the person you love. And so when I asked him to marry me, his comment was, uh, why all of a sudden this change of heart? What's changed? And I said, well, we're in our 70s. We're not getting any younger. We love each other very much. And why not? What I didn't add was, I'm frightened that something is happening. And I want to be there to be able to protect you no matter what. And so what did happen was at the end of 2016, we were in Vienna and we, we, we traveled a lot and we were there. I was there on business. Nikki was with me and um, we were there for the Vienna uh, New Year's concert of the Vienna Philharmonic. And they were my client. And um, in real life, I'm a publicist. And uh, so Vienna was my client and the conductor, Gustavo Dudamel, who was conducting them, was also my client. So I had a double header going on. 
And we had this wonderful trip. And I noticed Nikki was very fatigued on this trip. And I thought, well, he's just tired, you know, traveling and all that. And then one night we were supposed to meet at a restaurant he knew well, which was a block and a half from where we were staying. And I met friends there and we were expecting Nikki and almost an hour passed, no Nikki. And he was always on time, if not early. And I got frightened and I excused myself and I didn't know where I was going to go to try to find him, but I had to try. And so I left the restaurant and I went toward the main square toward St. Stephen's Cathedral. And lo and behold, miracle of miracles, Nikki is walking toward me. It was like out of a movie and I was blessed and I knew it. And as I approached him, what I saw was fear in his eyes. And he looked at me and he said in a very abrupt manner, and Nikki was never abrupt. And he said, you didn't give me the address. You didn't write it down. And something in me went quiet. And I said, you are totally correct. It's my bad. I should have written it down. And I didn't. Please forgive me. I'm so glad you're safe. Let's go to dinner. And that was the beginning of seeing something that I was frightened of. When we came back stateside, uh, having gone to Paris in between, again, you know, very lucky couple doing what we wanted to do. But in Paris, there was a night that was a little scary. And little did I know what had happened is he'd had a heart attack. And I didn't know it. And he didn't know it because next morning he was fine. Went to our doctor when we got back, and Nikki always did a six-month checkup. He was a person who was very fastidious about the way he looked, about his health, about his exercise, and about his food, and about going to the doctor every six months. And this was the six-month checkup. And he said to the doctor, what happened to that calcium score test you had me take six months ago? You never gave me the results, and I'm curious. The doctor looked at the record and said, oh, my goodness. We're going to get you to a cardiologist now. And they sent him for a stress test. They found that his heart was in very bad shape from the stress test, that uh, he had had a heart attack. They couldn't tell us when, but it was damaged from a heart attack. And he needed to have an angiogram. That's what I proposed. <laughs> and, and, um, and we did get married on the 13th of February. On the 14th of February, Valentine's Day, we went to the hospital for the angiogram. And on the 15th, he was operated on for triple bypass surgery. And that was the beginning of the end because it's supposed to make you energized. It's supposed to cure your heart. It's supposed to, to be the, the panacea. And it was anything but the hallucinations, which began during the, that period, which uh, were the result of anesthesia. And we were told that's quite normal with, with heavy duty anesthesia for open heart surgery. Hallucinations are part of the, the, the trip, so to speak. But those hallucinations never left. And that I didn't know. That I didn't know till much later. And he was weak and didn't get stronger. And he kept losing weight. And the weight loss was alarming. A year and a half later, with all of this not getting any better, we switched our doctors and, and just because it was time to switch. And the new doctor that we got actually listened to what I was saying, which was, I think he needs an MRI baseline. They did it. They found a, a phrase that I hate uh, because I think it's a bunch of bunk, which is age appropriate deterioration which is code for, we don't know what's going on, <laughs> you know. Very and true. So, right. So um, from there, I said, okay, what's next, please? You know, this isn't good enough. And this doctor was so brilliant. And he sent us out of network to another hospital, to a neuro, um, a neurologist who was a brilliant diagnostician got it on the first try that it was Lewy body dementia from a cognitive test and watching him walk. It was diagnosed as Lewy body dementia with Parkinsonian aspects. So he had Parkinson's and Lewy body. And it was, um, it was so definitive. You know, he just said it. But then he said, we'll do a DAT scan, which is D-A-T scan, which is a, a dye that gets injected, which is like an MRI, except it is, it is very um, intense. 
in terms of, of brain uh, function. And they did a REM sleep test because people with Lewy body act out in their sleep. They, they, they punch, their legs go. And that's a sign with Lewy body. So hallucinations, REM sleep, uh, disorientation in terms of cognitive uh, ability and and memory loss, uh, handwriting that gets smaller and smaller. I mean, all these things can can appear, don't necessarily appear. And sure enough, after the two tests, I'm I'm fond of saying that they they didn't confirm the diagnosis; they supported it because there is a, a very different field of thinking about uh, whether you can confirm the diagnosis before autopsy or not. And I am a believer that you can, that is my personal belief. And I think that that all of these tests supported the diagnosis, which was accurate. Getting a Lewy body dementia diagnosis, especially right off the bat, that's very rare because it's not easy to to spot, to, you know, it's You're it's totally, not usually the, what's the word? Like, it's not the go-to people would assume. No, you're totally right. It looks like Alzheimer's and it behaves like Alzheimer's. It also can behave like a psychiatric disorder. And so um, there there are many, many uh, versions of, of um, Lewy body. That is, it looks differently on almost everybody. Uh, there are some similarities, but not a lot. So it's not a one size fits all. And the saying is, if you've seen one case of Lewy body dementia, you've seen one case of Lewy body dementia. And so you can't totally fault the medical profession for not getting it. But I think awareness is the key here. And that's that's my whole thing, is raising awareness. Through this book that I wrote, I didn't see it coming, Scenes of Love, Loss, and Lewy Body Dementia. It was written to bring awareness to a disease. Because my belief is that with awareness will come the kind of funds that need to support research. And with research, we're going to find biomarkers. And with biomarkers, we're going to find a, a slowing of it down or a cure finally. And that's what needs to happen. That's the process. But without awareness, none of it happens because doctors, medical profession doesn't know what it is looking at a lot of the time. And for instance, if you go into the ER, you know, if you're having a, a, an episode with Lewy body and, and things can get rocky and rough and, and, and angry and, and, uh, uh, I don't want to say violent, but but uh, certainly aggressive. And so you, you're taken to the ER because you're having an episode. And the first thing they're going to give you is Haldol. That is the last thing you should ever be given as a person with Lewy body dementia, because it will cause all kinds of problems and possibly a psychotic break. And if you say, my loved one has Lewy body dementia, they can't take Haldol, chances are they're going to look at you as if you have two heads, because they don't even know what you're talking about. So my advice to people to whom that happens, with whom that happens, is to say, my loved one is allergic to Haldol. If you say you're allergic, nobody's going to touch it. That's a good, good tip. Yeah. And I also will say that when you get end of life kits in hospice, you know, you get morphine and you get Haldol in that kit. And you you mustn't with Louis body. You mustn't use the Hal doll. You must throw it away. I mean, why are some kits to begin with for for Louis body? I have no idea, but but it is, and and you have to be vigilant. That's the biggest challenge with all of these cognitive diseases. Is that I feel like we have to do all the learning, and we have to educate the medical profession and. That's backwards, but that's where we're at right now, but, which is why awareness is so important. And and we do, Jennifer. I mean, it is so important that we get out there and we make people aware. Not, so, not just lay people, the medical profession too. Oh, definitely. I had a conversation with the doctor. Um, he prescribed the, you know, the acid reducers, the proton pump inhibitors, and I said, are you familiar with this study that has linked long-term use of these medications 
to increased risk of dementia. And you would have thought I had spoken Klingon or Babel or something because this doctor had no clue what I was talking about. And he's in a position to be prescribing these regularly. And he, he just shrugged his shoulders and went, eh. And he said, do you have dementia? And I was like, <clears throat> really wanted to, I really wanted to give him an education. And I said, no. And I gave him my family history, my mom, my maternal grandmother, my maternal great-grandmother. And I said, I will not be taking these medications long-term, but, you know, in the, for the three months that you're prescribing them, we'll see if it fixes the problem. I have like... Um, an issue with my throat that they think is silent reflux, which, okay, we'll try it. <laughs> yeah. Because they don't really... But not forever. Oh, heck no. No, by the time Valentine's rolls around, we'll be done. And the, hopefully the problem will be better because yeah. I don't really want to get into other... <laughs> like, I'm good no, with this and, and... diagnosis. I'm hoping what he's thinking works. He did look at my throat, so... We'll go there, but it just... And we're sending good wishes. Yes. Thank you. Well, it just appalled me that it was like he was completely clueless. Now, it's not you take these long term and you're increasing your risk. There's a link. So this study did a lot more to... It It produced a lot more questions than it did answers, which it's not a bad thing, but I kind of felt like he should have been at least aware that there was this study and he doesn't have to agree with it, but anyway, at that's the medical... Yeah, yeah, I was like, yeah. I keep thinking I should send him the article, but I keep not doing it. So maybe, I don't know. Maybe that's a clue. Okay. Well, I think we're here to be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> we're here to be helpful to the medical profession, not adversarial, just helpful. I guess I could send it to him and say, hey, here's this article that I read in case you are interested. Just kind of put it politely. I would. <laughs> so you no. um, kind of. Described some of Nikki's earlier symptoms. What other signs of possible Louie body are you aware of that maybe, you know, because obviously this is less known and less understood than Alzheimer's, which isn't understood very well either. So, <laughs> Right. Well, first of all, um, Alzheimer's is the most progressive of the dementias. Louie body is the second most progressive of the dementias, affecting 1.4 million people that we know of with it in the United States. Now, heaven knows how many more have it, but but it's a significant number. And if you if you add um, ALS, muscular dystrophy, and cerebral palsy, and put them all together, and those are all well known diseases, the aggregate number does not equal the Lewy body number. Staggering to think about that. So what what are the signs? Basically, it's hallucinations and delusions, uh, cognitive fluctuations, and that's what makes it very different than Alzheimer's. In Alzheimer's, you start at a level and that level uh, uh, cognitively decreases and stays decreased throughout your, your time with the disease until such time as you're, you're completely not uh, cognitively available. Uh, Louis body is like the roller coaster. It goes up and down. So one day you, the person are a hundred percent you. And the next day you don't even know who your loved one is. And that fluctuates back and forth. The person who's experiencing it knows what's happening. They understand it. Um, I know that for a fact because about two months before Nikki died, he wrote a poem, which I put in the book, which describes his descent in being taken over by this nasty person called Louis. And I used to say that there was Nikki who was present, and then there was Louis who was present. And the same thing with Alzheimer's, you know, sometimes it's the person and then it's Al who's present. And and so that that really um, is, is a big differential between the two. There's also a changes in movement, especially when Parkinson's is part of it. Uh, for Nikki, it was a dragging right foot. It was hands that weren't able to, to grasp things quite the same way anymore, ultimately leading to not being able to cut a piece of meat or using a utensil. 
And there's there's also the behavior shifts that someone who was never particularly angry or, or frustrated and all of a sudden those things come into it. And there's what I re- referenced before, the REM sleep disorder, which is acting out in your dreams. You know, as things progress, you, you get more and more symptoms. The swallowing becomes a, a problem. The leg cramps incontinence, you know, the list goes on and and it only gets uh, more severe and worse. I think that for the caregiver, it is very hard to watch all of this and to keep an equilibrium and to keep a positive attitude. However, when you stop to think about the person who's being affected by this, that person can't help what's going on. So your frustration doesn't help in the situation. It only serves to make the person feel bad. And of course, we're all human. And of course, we're going to to make mistakes and, and we're going to misstep. But as the caregiver, it's important when you're feeling those anxieties come on yourself or the anger, leave the room, just leave the room, scream into a pillow, breathe in some lavender, do some deep breathing. There are techniques where you can help yourself and then go back. If you're still feeling the frustration and the anger, then somewhere down the line, you have to forgive yourself for that because, you know, it happens, but you do the best you can. That roller coaster must be tremendously difficult for both parties. I mean, it's my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so it's difficult. So she died when I was 54 and... Yeah, I'm trying to do the math right. <laughs> and she had progressed, you know, slowly throughout the 20 years. It's hard to remember before Al, as you said. And, but there were never those days where it was my mom again. So I didn't have those like positive, hopeful days. And then right. the crashing down of, oh, now Louie's back or Al's back or whatever yeah. we, they are dealing with. So, Do they have specific Lewy body support groups? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Oh, yes. The the um, the support groups that I attended were run by an organization called the Louis Body Dementia Resource Center. Heavy on the resource, because these people were angels, in my opinion. Norma Loeb is the woman who started the Louis Body Dementia Resource Center about seven years ago. So it's a relatively new organization. Her mom had uh, had uh, Louis Body for about 18 years. That's long. That's very long for Louis Body. That's generally not the case. And, um, and Norma started this organization, support groups, helpline. The, the, the helpline is an amazing thing. Um, and and um, the um, the uh, website is so full of helpful information in many languages, I might add. Uh, and, and the helpline for anybody who's listening is lbdny.org. And it is 
It is such a blessing to have that. And so I I joined the support group. I was told about it um, by the actor David Hyde Pierce, who's a big advocate for Alzheimer's and, and dementia in general. And uh, he told me about this organization and they were my lifeline. So everybody needs an advocate of some kind, a sounding board. And I guess if I have one message to caregivers out there, it's you are not alone. You feel that way. There's no doubt about it. You feel like you're the only one on the planet who's having to deal with all of this. But you're not alone. You really aren't. And there are people here to help you. And and we're all among them. And there are resources. And you just have to reach out. It's not hard. The first step might be a little bit tenuous because you don't want to, to divulge. You don't want to share. But it's only in sharing that we learn. And the the neurologist who was so brilliant at diagnosis was not so brilliant at telling me what to expect. As a matter of fact, he wouldn't answer me. But he did say something that was um, that turned out to be prophetic. And what he said was, you will find out more from people who have the disease than you will from anybody else. And in that he was right. Because we all share openly what's going on. And it's not a pretty picture. But when everybody's going through it, you don't mind sharing it. And it's important so that, you know, it goes back to the sharing, goes to the awareness, leads to hopefully discovering a cure, maybe a prevention, and then everybody's better. I'm a big advocate that our society needs to understand these diseases far more than they do because it affects everybody, whether you're aware of it or not. And if you've got a neighbor who's doing odd things, it's much better for everybody. If you understand maybe what's going on, than maybe calling the cops on your wacko neighbor, who's trying to get into your back door or whatever. You're, You're right. You're right. And, and you know, this, this whole thing of, not being afraid to tell people what's going on. You know, we do have a fear. We have a fear of diseases like dementia. We have a fear of talking about them and we have a fear of death. Those two things are big ticket numbers. And for me, I, you know, Nikki and I sat down when he was diagnosed, we came home and he said three things to me. Other, Actually, he said it in the hospital waiting room. The first was, I... I'm looking forward to meeting your father. And I've always wanted to meet your dad. My dad died in 1981. So it was Nikki's way of telling me he knew he was dying. The second thing he said was, we have had a great run. We cannot be sad. And the third was very sweet. I live by that every day. And the third was, please. Help me to keep my dignity. And that third prompted the discussion about who do we tell? Do we tell? How much do we tell? And we made this collective decision together that we were going to bring our friends and family into our loop, tell them what the diagnosis was, tell them what the disease does, and ask for them, if they're able, to join us in this in this journey mostly everybody did the reason that we thought it was important and i say we because you know we get diagnosed we do this together i do believe that and the reason that it was important was because people will wonder what you were saying about the neighbor for instance who's trying to get in your back door and you call the police i mean the the fact is that what you understand you're able to then deal with and not gossip about. It's human nature if somebody's acting a little wonky to say, oh, what's going on with them? I mean, do they drink too much? Did this happen? You know, whatever. And the answer is no. There is a reason for this. And once you understand the reason, your ability to be compassionate and open and helpful is exponentially expanded. And that's really important. I agree. And I think people, they they hang their hat on, I don't want 
my loved one to be ridiculed. I don't want them to lose their dignity. And so they don't tell people. And that's exactly what happens. You guys did it right by bringing people in early before Nikki did something that could offend and turn off the friends. And then they walk away and they don't have the benefit of helping and understanding. And it reminds me of an article that I read and it kind of actually irritates me knowing what I know about Louis Body, which I got a lot more understanding after reading the book, is people that were sort of close to Robin Williams were like, he was a monster. And it's like, no, he was sick. And, and he I didn't think, know it. He right. didn't know he had Louis Body. I think he was diagnosed diagnosed with Parkinson's, which was part of it for sure. But it was only in autopsy that they found his brain was riddled with alpha synucleins, which are the rogue proteins that are Louis bodies. That's probably not a word you expected to be able to pronounce like that. <laughs> no, no, it's not. And I don't use it very often because nobody will remember it. What you do remember is that rogue proteins, these, these proteins uh, attack your brain and they do damage. That's what you need to know. And it's when you're talking about dignity, it bothers me that people remember him and are sharing that feeling about him when they don't realize that it was most likely the disease and his not understanding what was going on. I mean, it's not a secret that he was a pretty heavy drug user earlier in his years. I think he was still doing drugs somewhat be probably to deal with the disease because if you're having hallucinations you probably want to do anything to shut those off but are there other well-known people besides obviously yes. that's the only only one i can think of no, that i know no, uh, tom siever the ball player for the mets uh he he had louis body uh casey Kasem, the dj the celebrated dj uh the actress the the old actress dina merrill had it. Uh, Frank Corsaro, who was head of the Actors Studio here in New York and a, and a major uh, Broadway and, and uh, opera director, had it. So they're there. Estelle Getty is another one. Oh, okay. So had, Casey Kasem is probably up there in my teenage years and young adult years with Robin Williams, because I'm an 80s kid. So Casey Kasem, you know, always playing the hits. Yeah, exactly. The exact exactly. term is not coming to mind at the moment, but I'm sure most of my listeners can relate to Robin Williams and Casey Kasem. And were they diagnosed after after they died or? Uh, Robin Williams after. Uh, Casey Kasem, I believe, during his, his uh, lifetime. Um, Tom Seaver, I believe, during his lifetime. Yes. And, and yet... Um, Someone currently who has uh, Louis body dementia is Ted Turner. Ah, oh, I don't think I knew that one. No, and and it's not. I mean, it is fact. It's just not widely known. He he on um, one of the CBS shows. Uh, I think it was uh, Sunday morning. Uh, basically, was interviewed. This is probably six seven years ago, and and they referred to it that he had it. It was in his earlier stages, and and uh, but. You know, until somebody or a family of somebody uh, comes forward and and gets behind this cause, it is not going to have the traction that it needs to have. For instance, Bruce Willis and his family. I just have such admiration for these people who have come forth and said he has frontotemporal dementia because they are going to help so many people. By doing that, he's a beloved character and people will, will respond. I'm waiting for the day when somebody, I mean, I don't wish it on anybody, please. But if someone has it out there who is a celebrity, won't you please think about coming forward and joining us in making people aware? It's what happened with cancer. I mean, yes, I think yes. this was... People were hesitant to refer to it as cancer, and they called it the big C. I think that was a little bit before my time. Um, I know we had a family friend who had breast cancer, and it was a little hush-hush, which is now people talk about it very openly. So Absolutely. I think we're getting there with these cognitive diseases, and that's why your book and these kind of conversations are so important. And 
you know, I, I do a lot of advocacy for Alzheimer's for obvious reasons. <laughs> and you're yes. doing the same for Louie Body. <sighs> it's a lot of yeah. work. Well, it's a lot of work, but it's the kind of work that that will lead to answers. You know, without awareness, nothing happens. Put your head in the sand. It's not going to do it. And you it won't go need, away either. No, it won't. No, it's it's there. It's with us. So it's time to take the gloves off and throw the punches where they need to land, which is right in the economic sector, which then funds what needs to be done. I mean, we need awareness, then we need funding, then we need the brilliant minds that are out there to, to find those, those cures. And then we have a better society. And the brain, in my opinion, is the last frontier to be conquered. I fully agree. I've said that a lot. You know, they talk about space and going to Mars and yeah, well, that's interesting, but that I think they know way more about space and Mars and all of that than we know about our brains, which is yeah. scary, but interesting. Yes. With Alzheimer's, there's a lot of talk, especially lately, <clears throat> excuse me, about lifestyle choices being important for brain health and slowing the progression of the disease if you catch it early enough, which is still not super easy. Is there any kind of advice similar for Louis Body? I would assume some of the, you know, eat right, get good sleep, <laughs> exercise, all those well, things that people the, really don't want to do. Yeah, those are those are just uh, just good health in general. But but they they know so little about Louis Body dementia, and so there there is there is no roadmap here. There is no roadmap, and. You know, the, the title of, of the book is pretty apt. I didn't see it coming. None of us sees it coming. Not any of it. And and this comes on seemingly quickly. Although if if I look back, probably a good eight years, maybe 10 years, there were little signs, little signs along the way, but not anything you would you would point to and say, huh, that's a problem. It was just in the moment. And those are little signs then became bigger signs. So being aware is is just key in, in all of this. What were the little signs that you can look back on and go, oh, yeah, that probably was a key? Uh, I would see uh, a little paranoia. Nikki was not paranoid. I would see anger, flares of anger. Again, not in his general nature. Fatigue, not part of the recipe. Those are the early things that I saw. And then as we got closer to 2016, I saw things like forgetting words. I mean, this is a man who finished everybody else's sentences. So, you know, um, this is, I, I saw, um, I saw tentativeness in speaking. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I saw the leg dragging and then that everything was fine. And then it wasn't again. And I remember being in Stockholm, Sweden, and this was after the open heart surgery. And we got, I, I got to the airport and I thought, Nikki has no idea how to get through security. Oh my God, I think I've made a mistake by taking this trip. And it was a business trip I had to take and he was invited as a guest. And we got through security and we got to the hotel in Stockholm in Sweden and Nikki couldn't find his way from the front desk to the hotel room or from the hotel room down to the breakfast room. I realized he had to be accompanied every inch of the way. And then I realized that the fatigue was uh, off the charts, and that he needed to sleep all day in order to be functional at the the evening festivities. It was so frightening, and that's when I began to realize we need that MRI. We need we need this really looked at seriously because something is dramatically wrong here, and indeed it was. 
And the doctors just assumed it was like residual recovery from the open heart surgery? Yes, yes. And then and then it wasn't. You know, you can go for six months with with things healing and and but but you get beyond a year and things aren't better. There's something going on. And I've uh, traded notes with other Louis body folks who have experienced heart surgery. And this is just anecdotal, but there seems to be a correlation between anesthesia and recovery in terms of, of brain activity. And what happens is, I think, and this is only a supposition, that the anesthesia, depending on how long you're out, will exacerbate what's going on in the brain. It has to be there. I mean, I don't think anesthesia manufactures it. But if those rogue proteins exist, I think that anesthesia of, of a duration will shake things up. I'm, I'm a pretty good big advocate for being very cautious about surgeries as we age. I have a family friend who had both knees replaced, kind of a standard thing these days, for better or worse. And I, he had a third surgery. I don't remember what it was for. Nothing serious, nothing like open heart surgery. Um, and he never was quite the same after the third one. He had cognitive uh, yeah. issues. Um, I don't think he has Louis body based on what I know from his demeanor. Right. But it's like, you know, was were all those surgeries super necessary? I mean, he was already in his late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, your knees are crappy. Mine act like two rusty hinges. It's not fun, but... You know, I'm not going to have them replaced until absolutely necessary because you got to have them replaced again, you know, 10, 15 years later. And nobody discusses, you know, anesthesia alters your brain temporarily. Yes, and if does. you do, you know, a knee replacement in January and then maybe again the second one in July and then, you know, the following February, you need something else. That's a lot of brain alterations you're doing. <laughs> yes, it is. And and I am I am with you. I do not believe that uh, unless it's absolutely life-threatening, that that is a good idea at a certain age. I simply won't do it. I, I'll take the creaky knees. Thank you very much. There are ways to strengthen them. I'm working on that. But, yeah, you know. Absolutely. The, Exercise is a good thing. It's yes. not always fun. But, no, you know, not. the fact that my office is downstairs is um not necessarily ideal, but we'll we'll deal with it. If we have to move locations in 20 or 30 years, that's that's on the table. We're Got not it. married to these specific walls. I think that's the other thing people need to understand is that we need to make it easier on ourselves to age versus clinging on to a single family home that is not designed for aging in place or people with any kind of chronic illness like crappy knees or Alzheimer's or Lewy right. body or whatever else is out there. I'm trying to avoid them all. No, and, and also depending upon where you are, where you're living, you need to feel safe mm -hmm. and protected and above all loved. Those are the three elements that I think make the difference. So the surroundings don't don't matter as much as that feeling of protection and safety and love. I agree. I know a podcaster that just moved his dad from one state to another. Dad now lives across the street from him. This just all happened. So, you know, my my first instinct is yikes, changing their, um, you know, their surroundings can be challenging but he'll have you know son daughter-in-law grandchildren more people close by to help out and they fixed up the house so that when his dad arrived from the old old state it felt like home i mean he enlisted a couple dozen or more people and in five hours the house went from empty to situated like pictures hung picture you know, i was like wow and it's like when you say the surroundings are more important in the or not the surrounding but the feeling 
I think the feeling that he gave his dad immediately is going to be a big, big difference in his that, transition. So that is so beautiful and so important. Yeah. If he, if he wasn't across the country, I would have been one of those people either helping pack up or helping unpack. Um, but it's, it's a cross country trip. So yeah. <laughs> wasn't, God. wasn't an option. So where people can, where can people find your book? Uh, basically, you can go to Amazon.com. You just put in, uh, I didn't see it coming, Mary Lou Falcone, and Amazon has it. Barnes & Noble has it. Your local booksellers may have it. I'm, I'm a big advocate of local booksellers as well. And um, it it is hopefully going to be a tool to help you navigate. Uh, it's a story. It's a love story. It's our love story. But within the love story, is the truth and what really happens. And I think that if you're going to write, which I always said I would never write, but then again, I learned never say never. But if you're going to write, then it is, I think, incumbent upon you to tell it all, not just the, the pleasant parts. Because if you're going to help someone, they need to know the full story, not the partial story. Well, and the best thing about your book, I'm not sure any chapter is more than what, five pages? Yes. Two or three pages. Right. So it's perfect for caregivers. If you need your five minute you time, you can pick up this book and read one to three chapters in five minutes and feel connected to other people who have gone through this. And and then you can get back to all the other things you got to do. <laughs> Well, thank you for saying that. I really appreciate that. I, I wrote concisely for a reason. And it's because caregivers in particular don't have the time to, to spend luxuriating in pages and pages and pages. You need your information in a in a palatable way, but in a concise way. And that's what I, I tried to, to bring to my reader. And there's a lot of other characters, so to speak, other family members we didn't get to touch on. Um, Marianne's got a very interesting background as a caregiver, so Nikki was not her her first go around with caregiving. So you can learn more about that when you when you read the book. And I will make sure that the the resources that you mentioned earlier are in the show notes. So anybody that's dealing with Louis body or suspecting they've got a Louis body situation happening can. Just easily click on them. They're hot links, and and get I would the support. That. Yeah, it's it's important. I do a lot of advocacy with the Alzheimer's Association. Understandably, that's that's my my group. Yep. But like I said, we're all in this. Yep. Dementia is is the umbrella. Yep, and off of it come these spokes, and we're all part of it in some way, shape, or form. If not the the person who has it the person who is caring for and or will be involved in some way. And it's just nice to know if, you know, your neighbor is suddenly shouting at you across the fence for like, why? Maybe you'll have a little more understanding and you could be a help instead of making things yeah. worse unintentionally. But, right. you know, but, my, again, oh. my platform is everybody in society is affected by one of these cognitive impairment diseases you just may not be aware of it and we need to spread that awareness so right. i'm glad that you came on today to help spread the awareness of louis body since that's not my my lane but I, I appreciate the opportunity and i appreciate the opportunity to to just uh encourage kindness yeah we definitely need more of that fading memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts